just going to share it. Have you had breakfast? Yeah, yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah, we're 10 o'clock here, so. You don't have break on weekends? No, no, I'm furloughed at the moment anyway. All right, then. Going live in a few, in about a minute. Are there are days when it doesn't work, even on YouTube. I have no idea why. It, probably okay. a lot of people are using it. You know, there were a lot of the the videos with Ali Simon. They got a lot of uh, views, man. A lot of people watched it. A lot of people commented about it. And I got a message this afternoon. They said they were still blown away by the interview with Simon because it was so emotional. He got really oh, cool. Emotional. Yeah, he said Hanaka message you right yep that, but other media also mentioned uh got in touch with me and they said that was a heavy heavy interview because simon just got really emotional oh nice i spoke to him not long ago actually simon all right okay we're going live here we go i'll ask you first about the pen uh how is everything at home with the pandemic you know I'll ask you that, and then we can go straight into football. All right, we're live. Good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to Phil Oil Flying V Sports in Sapang Football with Rob Gear. He is our special guest for today, and this man, he was a rock in that middle for the Yazgals from 2009 to about 2014, 15. Am I right, Rob? Yeah, something like that, mate. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he formed a tandem with Ali, Ray Johnson, and Anton Del Rosario in those years. And um, they turned back many an attack. In fact, they made one of the Yazgals one of the toughest teams to beat during that time. I'm not saying they're tough, to, they're, they're easy to beat now, but they started it all. Without further ado, the great Rob Gear. Rob, how are you, man? Hey, Rick. Yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, no, we're all right. We're all getting a little bit older, like I said to you, but um, a few more gray hairs I've got coming through. But yeah, we're all right, mate. We're okay. The kids are good. Uh -huh. um, just kind of dealing with this situation the best we can. So everyone's healthy. Everyone's, everyone's safe, which is the main thing right now. How's it in London, man? How's the pandemic over there? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I live about an hour outside London, probably a little bit more, more in the countryside. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm in Oxford, in a place called Oxfordshire. Um, so yeah, we have, we're lucky that we've got wide open spaces and a lot of greenery. The, the, the town that I live in is only, I think we've got about 10,000 people, so it's not huge here. Um, mm -hmm. So we're a bit cut off, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's... It's it is what it is, right? We we're, we're still under some form of, of lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. We're social distancing and stuff. Um, we can only meet in groups of six at the moment um, with one other household, and and you know, so there's various bits and places and bits and pieces in place at the moment to try and keep everyone safe. But um, yeah, I think we're you know, there's there's certainly a downward trend, which is good. The 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 alert level here in the UK has been dropped. Um, it's gone down one level yesterday. Um, so hopefully there should be a few more social distancing, easing measures coming out over the next couple of days. So, yeah, we're, we're okay at the moment, right? That's good news. Um, in terms of work now, what are you doing? Do you still, uh, the last time you spoke, you were still doing some scouting, helping the teams over here. Do you still play? Do you yeah, so, no, so for a number of years now, I've been, um, so I've got my, I've got my UEFA A license now. Um, Great. Um, I've had that for, for two or three years now, so I'm hoping to jump on my pro license soon. Um, so basically I just started up coaching really. So it was kind of, um, I used to do some scouting and bits and pieces for the national team at the time. And that, as I came towards the end of my career and that kind of sparked, um, sparked an interest in coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I realized I was quite analytical about the game and I could understand it quite well so it's kind of naturally just turned my hand to coaching and so for two years now I've been academy manager at Rarely Football Club uh, for the women's department so um, you know kind of oversee the program the academy program for uh, 17 to like 23 year olds wow. um, 
um, the head coach of that team as well. So, um, you know, women's football's getting like it is in the Philippines. It's, it's getting bigger and bigger over here. It's just kind of taken an explosion since the World Cup, um, certainly since the World Cup when, our, when England did really well. Um, so it's just an exciting um, exciting part of the game to be involved in at the moment. And, I'm, yeah, it's, I've been, this, I'll be coming into my third season now doing that role. Thoroughly enjoying it. The girls are brilliant. Um, you know, the, just the staff I get to work with, my team under me as well is great. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all coaching at the moment. It's all football, football, football. Right. You mentioned that you were the analytical sort. In fact, I do remember you would come up with the scouting reports for the Ascals back then. So was the transition easy for you from a player to being a head coach? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say it was easy. Um, I was always someone throughout my career, I, I understood the game quite well. I could read the game quite well. I could understand, you know, I could see situations. Um, and Michael Weiss was the coach at the time. Um, and I saw that there was a bit of a gap that we, you know, whilst, you know, whilst I was still playing, it was, you know, we probably weren't getting the, the detailed reports that we might be able to get. So I, I kind of offered my services to the management, the coaching staff at the time and said, look, do you want me to compile some stuff? Um, so I started doing some, some video analysis. We did, I did some statistical analysis um, going back, you know, you know, where the goals come from so we could learn how to you know, stop them essentially or, you know, opponent analysis, uh, analysis on our, our own team as well. Right. And that kind of sparked an interest really and I really delved into the game a lot more. So um when when playing eventually finished when my career actually finished i was i was already on the path to getting my licenses and my badges um and then going into coaching yeah i started right at the bottom i just started just doing coaching a development team um like a, like a very basic kind of academy um just to learn the trade and learn mm-hmm. learn what it was like to to coach and how, to, how it was to control a, a group of players and, and that and, and it's just kind of evolved from there so um, yeah I retired back in um, 2015 I think it was like you say 14-15 um, so I've been doing this for like six years now so it's been been coaching for six years and you know still learning still developing um, still got a lot to learn but um, you know I'm, I'm I feel really confident now as a coach and the head coach so it's yeah it's it was a natural transition, really. Wonderful news. How do you feel about the statement that Ali Borromeo and Ray Johnson said it made it easier defending with you over there because you're, you, be, you and Neil being very vocal? What's your reaction to that, to, to that statement um, with Ray and Ali? Yeah, that was, I mean, that was part of my game, right? You, as a player, you have to play to your strengths. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, every, every player, every every player in the team gives something different to the team, a different contribution. You know, Phil, there there are people like Phil who are technically superb and and you know they contributed to the, with their goals and and their presence on the pitch. You know, I was always someone growing up that was you know I was my technical foundation was solid. You know, I could I could see a pass, I could play a pass, but I read the game really well and and I, I quickly learned that I needed to. Um, my communication needed to be good. Mm-hmm. I'm not the tallest. Well, I'm not the tallest centre back when I was you know, over here in the UK. I wasn't the tallest centre back, so I had to make sure that I I read the game well and I was able to communicate to those around me. Um, so I mean, by the time I joined up with the national team, I was you know I was 28, 29. Um, so I'd had a lot of experience behind me. I played in the league over here in the UK. Um, you know, and had a had a career already over here in the UK by the time I came to join up with the national team. So, you know, that was just part of my game. It was just trying to help those around me, trying to pull everyone around to help me do my job a little bit easier as well. That's kind of the idea That's about right. it. That's right. Okay, this is the 10th anniversary of that historic Suzuki Cup, Rob. I'm going to jump to today before we get back to what happened in 2010. Do you ever, how often do you think about the events? Because that really spurred on Philippine football and uh, in, in a massive, massive way. Do you still, how often do you think about that? Yeah, we've, I found like I've been talking about it quite a lot recently because obviously it's coming up to the 10-year anniversary. We, we, had a, we had a little catch-up last week. I don't know if any, any 
people saw it, but we there's a few of us that jumped on a Zoom call and Anton put it out there on, on his on his page live. And, you know, that was just really nice to kind of reminisce and chat with people. I had a chat with Christy not long ago. I, I spoke to Maka. Um, he was on your show the other day. And, um, yeah. you know, we were just kind of reminiscing about old times. And I guess that's what this pandemic has, has kind of helped you to do, really, to take, take stock of things. I mean, you know, you see in the background, I've got my, that's my Suzuki Cup shirt in the background. I've only got, they're the only pieces of memorabilia I have in my house of my career. Um, so. Uh, the one on one over my right shoulder here is my debut shirt. Then I've got the Suzuki Cup shirt, and then mm -hmm. there's a picture of me leading the team out for the national team. So, you know, uh, like I said, I, I came into the national team. I had a, I already had a career over here in the UK. Um, so coming over with joining up with the national team was almost like a second career for me, mm -hmm. um, and one that holds really, really special memories. Not just 2010, but the whole thing. You know, the whole. Um, I think I was involved with the national team probably six years I think in total something like that um, six or seven years and you know it was just a really happy time I, I, I loved everything about it the, the Suzuki Cup was the highlight of my career probably I would say you know there, there's other milestones that go along with that along the way but it was certainly one of the most memorable things that I ever did as a player um, and just you know just thankful to be to be able to be part of it it was it was a special time with a really really special group of players playing under you know um special circumstances really and and the whole the whole experience was just one on yeah I'll, I'll never forget it never forget it before we continue with the discussion with rob gear we want to acknowledge the presence of a former teammate of yours angel girado he's watching right now <laughs> uh roel hener is watching rob Ah, uh, Roel. Yeah. Hey, Roel. Hey, Angel. Ian Ernest is watching. Ah, <laughs> uh, some, some more Coach, legends of the Ascals watching. Cool. Coach Maor Rosen is watching also. Ah, uh, nice. Coach, Coach Juan Cutile sent a message. He said that he'll watch it later because uh, it's still pretty much early over there. So, all right. Okay, get no, ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so, Sorry. No, no, it's great. It's, uh, hey, guys, all those guys, how you doing? <laughs> and more are going to be watching. Actually, we have some coaches watching from Cebu. And as far as, what's this? Uh, Cotobato. <laughs> yeah, quite a few people watching us, Rob. All right. Rob, um, heading into two th the, the Suzuki Cup, can you talk about the mood? You know, uh, Simon only came in August. He picked up part of Des Bolton's uh, game plan and put in, of course, his own ideas. What was the mood and the confidence level of the team when we arrived in Vietnam, in Hanoi, to be particular? Well, I mean, if I, if I may, if, if we just go even back to, to the qualifiers, really, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of... It, it's talking about stuff like this, it makes you realize, you know, you kind of go back and have a look at what actually happened and get into a little bit more detail about what actually happened. And we, we only, we only qualified by the absolute skin of our teeth in yeah. for that, that competition. Um, um, I remember we, we, we won our first qualifying game and um, I think it was five nil, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, that's right. And, um, and then we drew the other two games, um, mm. Lao and Cambodia, yeah. in the last game. And I don't know if you remember Ian, so Ian's watching, but he scored a hat-trick against Timor Lest. He did. And we only qualified, we only qualified out of our group because we had like plus three goal difference better than Cambodia. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. you know, we, we talk about all these big, big moments. I know Chrissy obviously scored the goals in, in Vietnam and Singapore and, you know, Phil, Phil scored the goal as well. But I mean, if it wasn't for Ian's hat-trick in that opening game, then, you know, we, the, none of this would have even happened. Um, funnily enough, I, I um, just while we were just before we kind of logged on here, I was I, I watched I, I'd stuck on YouTube and had a look at the, the Cambodia game, the, the final game before uh, the qualification process, which we drew nil nil. Uh -huh. We were lucky in that game. They 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 had a they had a free kick that hit the post. They had another strike that hit the bar, uh, free kick that hit the bar, and it came back out. 
to a guy in the six yard box who was unmarked. He headed it towards goal and Neil got up and made a quick save. You know, so we, the whole, you know, we went into that tournament actually qualifying and going into the tournament. There was absolutely zero expectations from, from us. I mean, we were just delighted to be there and be part of it. Um, you know, going to the defending champions and, and, you know, just, we were just generally looking forward to the experience that it was going to bring us. Um, mm -hmm. We knew we were, we knew we got through by the skin of our teeth. Mm -hmm. We knew, um, we knew we were going to be up against it with Vietnam and Singapore in our, in our group. So it was, yeah. you know what, let's just go out there and just, and just kind of see what happens and just enjoy, right. enjoy, the, enjoy the experience as much as we can. Right. At the start of the press conference the, the, that preceded the tournament, the other countries, uh, Singapore and Vietnam in particular, were talking about how many goals did score against the Philippines. And I recall asking them during the press conference, what do you think of the Philippines and how do you size them up? And the coach Raddy of Singapore said, oh, let, let's talk when, when you win a game. And Simon, as he recounted in our interview the other day, he was like, he was incredible. It's like, these two, these two guys next to him were talking. He felt, he felt it was justified, but at the same time, he felt disrespected because they were looking beyond that game. And he couldn't wait to tell the team about it. I'm not sure if you were there watching in the back as it was unfolding. But, okay, here's the question then. Um, did you know about the disrespect uh, that was being levied against the team? Like, okay, we're going to beat these guys. I, I think... The, my honest answer is no. I, I can't remember that, mm -hmm. but I would imagine. I can imagine that Maka would have would have mentioned it to us before the game. Now, mm -hmm. I'd be lying to say if that was that was a, a, a like a, a driving force behind um, my own personal approach to the game. I'd be mm -hmm. lying if I said that. Um, but I know that it would have been it would have been motivation for some of the players for sure to go into that game. Um, we obviously, you know, like I say, we, we went into that tournament wanting to enjoy the experience, but on the same token, we didn't want to go out there and get embarrassed. Um, we didn't want to go there and be that team that could see five, six goals in, in a tournament. You know, we didn't want to be that team. So, you know, national pride and, and, and individual pride and team pride um, comes into it more than anything else. Um, you know, if, if, if that had an effect on some players, then then great because you know that that was what they needed at the time. But for, for me personally, it wasn't it wasn't a dry, it wasn't my main source of motivation. Kind of, you know, as as professionals, you kind of go out and you just on the day you just want to do as best as you possibly can for the team. And and it was just it it was a moment where we were just all on the same page. We had everything to fight for everything to gain and absolutely nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what showed in our performances overall. Mm -hmm. That's a lovely way to put it, everything to gain and nothing to lose. Um, okay, Singapore. They score first. But <laughs> unlike in years past, they couldn't really, how do you say this, uh, beat us by a number of goals. I mean, we were holding, the defense was holding, and we were still in the game. Did you feel that we had a chance, a chance then, even before Chris scored? Because we were right there. Um, yeah, I mean, when it's always the way in football, if you can weather that kind of early storm, when you know that there's always going to be an early amount of pressure in the first half, you're, you're, you know, the game plan, you know, we obviously sat in, in, a, in a low block, if you like, um, yes. Yes. and kind of encourage Singapore to say, come and then try and beat us. Um, and we knew we could kind of hit them on the counter attack. Mm -hmm. um, that whenever you play that system, you have to, one, you have to make sure that you keep things tight, certainly for the first 15, 20 minutes. Right. And then you're relying on the other team to then get frustrated, right? You're, you're then relying on them to, to get more and more frustrated as the game's going on and think you'll find that things start to fall your way. I mean, they didn't score their opening goal. I think it was, it was in the second half anyway. Mm. Um, so, you know, we held them off till then. And once that first goal goes in, 
no matter what game and what scenario you're playing in, it's always the next thing that the, the senior players in the team would be saying, whether it come from me or Neil or Ali or Chris, whoever that might have been, it was, you know, we don't go any further behind right now. You have to stay in the game. Right. You have to stay in the game. So, you know, those next probably five, ten minutes after team score against you, you need to be heightened. You're, you're, you know, everything about your game needs to be on point for that next 10, 15 minutes because the game could quite quickly run away from you. That's um, right. And we managed to we managed to weather that. I mean, my, my memory for the actual game itself it isn't hugely clear. Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember if they, they were having chance of after chance after chance or if, if we were hanging, you know, if we were hanging on or if we were, if we were holding our own. I, I, I can't remember. But I just know that in those situations, in those games against teams that outside people were perceived to be better than you, you have to stay in the game because you never know what's going to happen. You know, it's like when you watch the FA Cup over here, when, when you know, teams from lower divisions play against Premier League teams. You, you stay in the game because in the 90th minute, you could get a set piece or anything could happen in that 90th minute and then that could be your moment. And luckily for us, that, that, that's what happened in this game. We stayed in the game. Um, and then just, I, I think it, was, it, was, it wasn't the last minute. It was 90 plus something, wasn't it? I mean, it was... Yep. Ninety deep. plus four, five. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was deep, deep, deep into injury time, and yeah. yeah, just stay in the game as long as you can because you never know what's going to happen, and then something incredible happened. Right. You mentioned earlier about Ian scoring a hat trick that got the team into the Suzuki Cup. In that particular game against Singapore, Anton tackled Daniel Bennett, and that led to Jay the ball going to James and James finding Chris for that header. Um, what do you recall of that moment? The moment that, that, that was such an incredible, incredible moment. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's, I think probably everyone, everyone that was involved in that game will say that <clears throat> that was probably the, the, you'll never get another feeling like that ever, 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 ever. The, the, the moment when that goes in is, yeah, you, 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 all you have to do is just watch the, just watch the, um, the video online about how much it meant to everyone. Like we were all there. Neil came running. The bench went crazy. Um, and it's just, I, 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 you can't really put your finger on what it is. I mean, you know, you have to bear in mind that, like you say, we, we knew that they, Maka would have informed us before the game that Singapore was saying that, you know, we weren't a real competitive opponent. You know that you've just, grafted for 90 minutes, put everything on the line and, and you know, worked incredibly hard to stay in the game. Um, you know, you're kind of almost used to the fact that, you, you know, you really, as you're playing the game, you don't want to be that team that's like, oh, we were so unlucky, but we lost. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if we'd have lost the game, it would have been like, no one would have remembered that how hard we would have worked. It would have just been, uh, yeah, but you lost. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it was almost vindication of, the, of the, um, the hard work that we put in. And then when it went in, it was just, I remember some, because um, Vietnam were due to play after us, right? So yeah, that's right. We, we played first and then the Vietnam fans were starting to filter into the stadium before, um, before wow. their game. So there were a few people in there um, ready to watch the game after us. And they were obviously cheering for us. They wanted us to try and take a point off Singapore and, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah I remember when that going in and then all the Vietnam fans were cheering for us as well we, we went over to the side of the pitch yeah. um, and you know, like kind of in front of their fans there's a couple of really iconic photos that have, that have done the rounds from, from that moment and it's, it is pure it is pure ecstasy pure happiness uh, you, 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 and you'll always find that You'll always start. You'll always try to chase that moment again. You know, in sport, in you know, you'll always find that you're forever trying to chase those moments, and they don't happen very often. And they are incredibly, incredibly special. And yeah, just to be on the pitch for that moment was, yeah, I, 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 I get emotional thinking about it now. It like makes, I get kind of goosebumps thinking about it. It was that special. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. When we after the game. Uh, Singapore was lamenting that they were saying that 
uh, the Philippines sparked the bus. That's why we couldn't score a lot of goals. And um, I remember Simon saying, and he acknowledged this the other day in our interview, he said, well, it's not per parking the bus per se, but we needed to stop you guys in order to get our offense going. And it's just, it's just part of the game. And um, I recall after that, they were upset. So when we played, after we beat Vietnam, do you remember the guard of honor that awaited us at the hotel? And I remember asking Simon about it. He says, yeah, that was incredible. Because the teams of Myanmar and, and Vietnam waited for, for the Philippines to arrive. And we returned at, to the Sheraton Hot Hanoi Hotel around 11 in the evening. Because we'd spent quite a bit after the, the match. We spent quite a bit inside the locker room. Because it was just crazy, if you remember the locker room then. Is, it, would you, is this after the Vietnam game? Right? After the Vietnam game, yeah. right, right. Do you remember that Guard of Honor? At the hotel, I, I, I don't actually. I don't remember it. I remember oh. all the celebrations in the in the change room after the game. Um, I don't remember the guard of honor. No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, okay, we're gonna. I mean, what was it like playing against uh, someone like Alexander Durich? You know, because he was a handful. Yeah, I mean, we've had you know since that game, you know, we played them a couple of times. Played them in the the, the Suzuki Cup after that, and he was still playing and. Yeah, he's, absolutely, he's a handful. I mean, he's, he, had, he had pedigree at that level, um, experience at that level. Um, you know, really, I, uh, I'm not the tallest centre-half, so I have, to, I, I have to, you know, defend people like him in a different way mm -hmm. um, than some. I can't, I wouldn't be able to just, you know, physically push him out of the way. So, He's, he was someone that I that really challenged me um, and I had to be smart about how I tried to, to play against him. You know, maybe maybe that might be, I'd, I'd fake to go up for a header and then try and drop off so I could take it on my chest or I might need to try and nick around the side. I knew that if I go up for a 1v1 header with him, eight or nine times out of 10, I'll probably lose it just because of physical size and, and the way, you know, his experience in those situations. So um, you have to be smart. But, I mean, they were stacked as well. The Singapore team was stacked throughout with really, really quality players. So, um, yeah, going back to your point about them getting annoyed that we parked the bus, it was – you you have to play to your strengths in football. You know, this. The, it'd be, it would have been ridiculous for us to go out and play a high-pressing game and try and pass the ball all over the pitch and create nice, pretty triangles to go and then lose the game 5-6-0. But then everyone to turn around and go, oh, you know what? But they tried to play really nice football. But, you know, we, we played to our strengths in that game for that whole tournament. And, and it just goes to show that if you're well organised, if you've got a group of players that are really grafting after each other um, and then your, your, game plan is on, your game plan is on point, then <laughs> it's going to be tough for anyone to break down. So, you know, I, I'll make absolutely no apologies for the way we, we approached that tournament. It was... It was what we needed to do at the time to get to try and get a result out of the tournament. It's part of the game too. So mm -hmm. I want to show you a picture here. Hold on a second. I need to op click open that picture. Okay, this is right before the Vietnam game. And um, if you recall, Rob, during the press conference, uh, the ones who sat on the table were you and Simon, so I'm going to show you right here because you know me, I took I take pictures of everything. So <laughs> this is the, the picture that preceded the press conference against Vietnam. Can you take us through for so that the people watching can understand? Okay, we we, we got a point off Singapore. Now it's the biggest game of the tournament. Um, what well, what was the game plan and what did Simon tell you? What do you recall of that? especially of this press conference. Um, <laughs> Honestly, Rick, I don't even remember doing the press con. <laughs> well, that's um, you, right <laughs> Yeah, my, my recollection for this kind of stuff is, is not great. Um, I remember moments, I remember big moments, I remember certain feelings and stuff, but um, I, sometimes I get lost in the detail and things. But mm -hmm. I know that, you know, you have to remember how much energy we would have expended against Singapore. Mm -hmm. playing for 90 plus minutes in that game um, 
and the emotional draw. I mean, even even the fact that you score the goal, it's um, the emotional um, energy that's used in those last moments of the game is huge. So you've only got three days to recover before you go again and you've got to play. Um, hang on a sec, Rick. Come and say hi. My son's here. Say hi. Hi. Um, hello. Good morning. Okay. Okay, well, can, yeah, you can take, you can take this instead, sweetheart, okay? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. It's actually cute, you know. <laughs> you take it, it's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Shut the door, Boise. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, yeah, you, you don't have a, a huge amount of time to prepare. Uh -huh. you, you don't, you've probably got, so you play on one day, then the next day you're recovering, then the next day before that the day after that you'll you probably only got an hour of training session before that and then you're on to the game again uh -huh. um so you know you you're still we were still on a high after the singapore game we were you know we knew that the the tactics weren't going to be vast hugely different in the next game mm -hmm. we knew that the, the team would probably roughly take care of itself you know you kind of knew who your starting 11 would be mm -hmm. um and it was kind of a case of, all right, let's go out there again and, and kind of see what we can do. And um, I don't remember this press conference. Um, <laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember some of the training sessions that we had, but right. um, it was all kind of, you know, like I say, we, we, we knew what the game plan was. We knew how we were going to play. We, 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 we knew what the team was going to be, so it's just kind of trying to focus. We knew that it was going to be a massive game. We knew because um, we we could see that the, the people coming into the stadium after the Singapore game, we knew that it was going to be packed. Right. We knew that they were, you know, a powerhouse. So it was a it was a mixture again of looking forward to the game, going mm -hmm. to be enjoying the experience, but then there's that nervous energy in your tummy that you don't want to go out and get embarrassed yeah um you but we did have the high we did have a, a confidence boost against singapore mm -hmm. so you know it was you know exciting going into that game as well the morning of that match against vietnam we found out in the early hours that phil was ill uh he was up all night throwing up and that chief he would not suit up because he got knocked up a bit against singapore and roel henner was going to go into the starting unit uh, any concerns at that point? Were you worried like, oh my God, we might not have Phil. We don't have Chiefy, although Roel's coming in. Can you, what do you remember of that? It, yeah, it, it obviously caused us some concern. Mm -hmm. You know, missing Phil and Chiefy are two big players. Mm -hmm. Would have been two big players. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked about it. I've talked about it with Chris before and Chrissy and... I don't know how Phil got through that game. He was bad. He was really bad that day. Yeah. Um, you know, your kind of mind goes back to the, I'm sure you watched the, the last dance documentary as well, where Michael Jordan was super poorly playing one of the games. And it kind of, you know, it, it was that, it was a superhuman effort from him to, to even to suit up. Mm -hmm. um, but same with Chiefy. We knew that Chiefy, that was going to be a loss for us, you know, huge player for us during that period mm -hmm. but Henair came in and you know you have to say that he you know his, his performance throughout the whole tournament after that was absolutely outstanding mm -hmm. I mean you can't you know you can't say enough about how you're playing out on the on the right wing or left wing depending on, on, on what game it was he he came in and did a job and did it unbelievably well so you know, talking about unsung heroes of, of that of that tournament, he would certainly be right up there. His performances were outstanding, and um, but that's what it had to be. It had to be. Everyone had to be. You had to be at nine, ten out of ten every single game for that in order in order for that that run to happen. Um, and they were, and you know, it's again we were we were used. Uh, as a team, we were used to setbacks. We were used to stuff not quite going to plan in preparations. So, you know, now sometimes that was that was due to injury. Sometimes that was um, infrastructure or logistics in the build-up to 
games or tournaments. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were used to that. We were used to bumps in the road and we were used mm-hmm. to obstacles being put in our way. So, okay, there's some, something that has happened in the lead up to this game. It's, uh, it's going to put us at a slight disadvantage. But, hey, do you know what? We'll just get on with it and we'll roll with it. And, you know, you just got to do what you can do. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that all those, all those moments, you know, of hardship before um, the tournament um, really do lead to, you know, really close knit tight groups on the pitch. Um, I think back to even like the, the Challenge Cup in, in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we had, a <laughs> we, we had to go out early to acclimatize to, to the conditions and the altitude out there. Right. We, we were put in a, in a, in a hotel that wasn't the, the national, it wasn't the, um, the official hotel to acclimatize. And this place had no, no heating. No heating. It was freezing. <laughs> I remember, I remember Jimmy and Bill, they would sleep in their track suits with their big coats on. They were absolutely, it was freezing. <laughs> you know, and at the time, at the time, you're thinking, God, this is just the worst. But what it does, it brings you together, closer together as a group, because you can laugh about it, you can moan about it together. It brings yeah. you closer. And, you know, that was another tournament we did, we did pretty well in. So, um, yeah, all these, all these adversities kind of, they, they, they matter and they, they help when you're actually out on the pitch as well. Mm-hmm. Before we get any further, Angel sent a message. Hola, Rob. Nice to see you, said Angel. Oh, there he is, the big man, the big man, the most unorthodox player I think I've ever played with and against, for sure. Okay, um, show you a picture right here. Can you see that? Yeah, I got it. Hey, I got a lot of these pictures. If you ever need them, let me know. I, I probably yeah, have for sure. five, 500 pictures that I took during that tournament. What's it like playing with these guys, man? <laughs> uh, that was, you know, that was, yeah, it was good times, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Let's, mean, start, let's start off one by one, Rob. What, what was yeah. it like having Neil Etheridge at the back? It, well, Neil, he was just a big player for us. I mean, you, you, you look at the spine of the team at that time, um, what you call the spine of the team. So Neil was behind us. We knew that he was a big character. Mm-hmm. He was... Um, you know, a little bit immature at the time because he was only a kid, right? And, and, you know, making his way in the game, trying to navigate his way in the, in the professional game over here in England. Um, but, I mean, what a goalkeeper to have behind you. He's, he's gone on to prove that, you know, we could see it right from then that he was going to um, have a massive career. Um, right. You know, easily one of the best best goalkeepers in Asia he's got to be right now got to be um but he was you know he was one of those guys that was a little bit dopey <laughs> Neil he's you know and if, you know he gives off this persona of like ultra professionalism and stuff and he, and he was when it comes to the football side of things but we, it, we we all just got on really well he's someone that we probably laugh at Neil do you know what I mean it was it, he, he was such an important member of the group yeah um just and as a player, you he would you knew he was always going to make big saves. The, the big moments, he was going to help you out for sure. Um, so talented, um, shouting and hollering at the back. Me and him used to have a few occasions in games, um, and you know shouting backwards and forwards to each other. Mm-hmm. And and that's okay. And in that game situation, it means that we're all wanting to win. Because um, then, as soon as you step off the pitch, you're, you're, you're friends again. Do you know what I mean? But it's just it's yeah. just an expectation from between everyone that the standards have to be met while we're playing. Right. Um, you know, Rob, Jason was sorry. Go on, Rick. Can I cut you there? You asked yeah. in the Singapore game how much we withstood from the Singaporeans. It was in, against Vietnam where we withstood this barrage of attacks, especially after the first goal. Because I stood in the barrier behind Neil taking pictures and he was just really punching off, punching away all these shots that go on goal. And you guys were, and as Simon said, it, you guys were tackling like crazy because we were under siege right there, especially after that first goal. But once the second goal came from Phil, 
it was lights out for them. Anyway, um, about Jason? Yeah, I mean, Jason was a kid, wasn't he? Really, he was young, um, young and hungry. Uh, he, he was one of the first pers- people. He was the first national team member that I met, Jason, right back in 2009 before Challenge Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, tenacious, technically very, very good. Um, was able to cover the ground. You know, he he was spiky. He had he had um, you know quite an abrasive um, attitude towards the game. But but at the same time, he was you know he would he would lay down for you know put his life put his body on the line. You knew that he was going to give absolutely everything in every game. A um, little bit hot headed at times, uh-huh. but that made him the player that he was in central midfield. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he had quality on the ball. He was tenacious, um, you know, and he was going through a period where probably he, he was trying to learn about what kind of player he was as well. He was, he was young and maturing as a footballer. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I first joined the team, he was, you know, he, he, was, he would like to be a winger where he was kind of, you know, in the mould of Cristiano Ronaldo, that kind of thing. And then he slowly morphed into like a, a central midfield player, combative central midfield player and I think he done really 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 well in that position he was you know again it was they're all different characters in the team and Jason was just another part of that and um, you know his you know a lot of the time his work got he's in probably another little bit like Roel that Hanair that um, their work and their work rate goes a little bit underappreciated at times um, he had to cover a lot of ground in the games you know he was a kid he had to cover a lot of ground playing in an intimidating atmosphere and he thrived off that. Right. Um, Phil, I mean, what can you say about Phil? He's just, you know, just such a nice guy more than anything else. All the guys, we got on so well as a group of, of, of players and Phil had our X factor. Phil was our X factor. Yeah. Now every team, every team needs that one player that can produce something that can win them a game. Um, and he was that player. You know, you, if Phil was on the pitch, if you're keeping things tight, you knew that there was always going to be a chance, whether it was going to be from a free kick or from a moment of brilliance. Mm-hmm. Um, Phil was going to give you that. Um, and then just a really humble, nice guy off the pitch, you know, quite quiet. Um, but yeah, just to, well, I mean, his, his, his legacy speaks for itself, right? Um, exactly. And Jimmy, Jimmy was my boy. We, we, me and Jimmy get on really well. Um, just another, his work rate out on either flank was just, just incredible. The amount of, the amount of ground that James used to cover in a game, you know, you, you everyone nowadays has GPS units on. I'd like to see what, what Jimmy would cover in those games. He, he just had such an engine on him, mm-hmm. technically brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a really great right foot, could see a pass. Mm-hmm. Um, gets again, he's, an, he's another one of those that's a little bit spiky in games and gets a little bit hot headed at times, but, but that kind of adds to his, um, you know, that added to his game and he needed that. He needed that. That's when he played at his best. Right. And, you know, again, if you know you've got Jimmy delivering balls and you've got Phil in the box, you know, again, there's always a chance. Um, set pieces like, the qualifiers, you know, Jimmy will always come up. He's important in both boxes, attacking wise and defending wise. Mm-hmm. You know, you see on this picture how much taller Jimmy is than me, um, mm-hmm. and I was I was just centre half at the time. So, yeah, all I mean, everyone in that squad. I mean, you could go for everyone. Um, yeah, of course. Just, just, and I think it showed as well when we had a chat last week. We there's a few of us that got together again. Me, Anton, Ali was there. Ray was there. Chrissy, Jimmy, Simon, um, Ali and Anton. And, you know, we haven't seen each other for, well, a lot of us. I haven't seen that, those guys, you know, in a number of years now. But as soon as you click the Zoom on and then you start having a chat, it's, it was like we just saw each other last week. We were in the locker room just having a crack and having a bit, a bit of banter again. And, you know, everyone's taking the mickey out of Neil and everyone's taking the mickey out of Ray. And, mm-hmm. you know, it you know, that team spirit kind of is shown, that was shown back in 2010 is still evident today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, against Vietnam, uh, that was, you you mentioned earlier, that was a 
the goal by Chris against Singapore elicited such an incredible response from, from those watching on the bench and on the field. The win, when the final whistle was blown against Vietnam, it was all sorts of chaos. I took a video, it's actually on YouTube, of the madness inside the locker room. Because everyone was just screaming. And then inside one cubicle, you have Phil throwing up. I should, I should have punched it up for our video, but I'll just share it with you offline. But I remember uh, you, you running off the pitch with Neil, and Neil was just yelling like crazy. What do you remember of that massive win, that historic win that got Askel's main going and the Philippines' um, fortunes turning? Um, it, it was a different sort of emotion after the Singapore game because those, you know, the Singapore game, like you say, was was an explosion of emotion um, for one moment in the game. But you know, we scored. At, you know, Phil, Phil got the second goal with 10 minutes to go, I think. Right. Um, and, um, you know, you knew at that point that the game was won. We'd won the game. You know, they have been knocking on the door for 80-odd for minutes. They hadn't managed to break us down. You know, there's sometimes when you play in football matches, you just know it's your day. Right. And that, that was one of those days. You know, you know it's your day. Just like this, there's some games you're playing where you know it's not going to be your day. I, I would imagine that the Vietnam players were feeling that at that point no matter what you do in the game you just can't see you just either the luck doesn't go your way or the other team is just inspired and and they came up against a team that was just inspired that day and um i i remember it, it was it was a different kind of emotion at the final whistle of that game it was there was shock in with that um because you there's no way you can have we could have envisaged what would happen in the preceding years after this game. And, you know, as soon as we got back to Manila and stuff like that, we, we couldn't have, we couldn't have envisaged that. Um, but it was just, it was almost a, like a relief. Like Phil scores that goal and the second goal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, you're, you're looking around and you're thinking, shit, we're, we're going to, we're going to win here. Like yeah. they're, they're not going to, so you've got like that period, that 10 minute period after we've, they've scored that goal to, you know, you've got these emotions following around thinking, you know, we're, I, think, I think we've done it. I think we've done it. Um, I think they hit the bar, did they? I think they hit the bar after Phil scored. They did, they did. Um, and, and even then it was like, you know, as soon as that hit the bar, it was, that was kind of almost like, yeah, I told you, I knew it, we were going to win. You just like felt like there's nothing they can do right now. We are on our game, at the top of our game, and they're not going to win. So it's like a it's like a dripping effect. That the, the emotion coming out is like shit. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna win here. And then so when that final whistle goes, um, it's the emotion isn't an, an explosion of emotion. It's like you're looking around thinking, shit, boys, what, you know, look what we've just done. We're, this is unbelievable what we've just done. And, you know, I, I'd been involved with the team for a year before that, you know, but, but you could see it in the faces of some of the guys. I mean, you will look at the, I mean, Ali just breaks down. You can see it straight away in some of the videos. Like, uh -huh. you know, those guys that are grafted for God knows how long, um, putting up with those heavy defeats back then and, and, you know, just to kind of all those kind of bad moments that they, they would have had before that. Um, it all comes out in that one moment and you can see it. You can see Boogie down on his knees praying up to God and you can see Ali and Anton hugging each other and Neil comes over and Chrissy's there and, you know, the bench are just going mental and, and it was, um, yeah, that was, you know, you kind of, you have to remove yourself from it. And I, now that you're a little bit older, you can take a step back and you can look back at some of the pictures and try and remember what it was like. And it was just, you, you know, it, it, you, you can't explain it. You, you, you really can't because really we had, you know, you would have thought that the Singapore game was going to be your moment. You know, that was, OK, that's going to be our moment in, in the spotlight. We got a, a point against them. And then for that to happen against Singapore in their own backyard, in front of their own fans, was just, oh, yeah, you can't, uh, yeah, get emotional thinking about it. It was just, it was an, a really, really special, special time.
I'm going to show you something. Because when I asked Ali about that, this is what Ali said was, after that second goal, uh, he looked at Anton. And Anton said, is that scoreboard for real? And <laughs> I, took a, I took a picture that exact moment. No, no, sorry, not that exact moment. I took a picture then. Uh, let me share it with you right now. You see that? Yeah, there you go. Ten minutes to go, right? Yeah, something like that. Um, what are we? Okay, you you explained it already. But in the locker room, the even going going back to the hotel, we were quiet in that bus, if you recall, because the Vietnamese were lined out outside Mai Din National Stadium. They were in a state of shock, and we switched off the lights in the bus. And because we were afraid that we might not get back to the hotel. <laughs> and, then, and then Chris Greatwich starts screaming his head off in the window. Yeah, we beat you, we beat you. And I remember <laughs> Neil pulling him down like, you're going to get us killed, you're going to get us killed. And once we got back to the hotel, well, no one could sleep. No one could, you know, we, we stayed up till about four in the morning because everyone was like, oh my God. We're on the cusp of a semifinals berth right here. All we had to do was just get a point off me and Mar. Um, your thoughts then that the team was about to take this huge step in football history? Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you have to allow yourself time to enjoy the moment, right? But in tournament football, you can't let that moment go go too far because you know, you know that it would have been a crime to to have lost against Myanmar and, and not qualified for the semi-finals after what we've just achieved. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, I, one thing I re always remember is all of us, there was only one plate, you had to pay for Wi-Fi in the room. So, you yeah. know, everyone used to come down into the hotel lobby where it was free and we used to get on our phones and kind of right. message people or, or go on Facebook or whatever. And that was just another thing where, um, you know, it brought us together as a team. You know, everyone we everyone was down there all the time. Instead of just being upstairs and in your room, two to a room, mm -hmm. you know, you had 10, 12, 13, 14 boys down there just on the internet. And then invariably, you, you, whilst you're looking at your phone, you have a bit of conversation and you, you chat. Um, so, you know, they're the moments that stay with me that I can, I can remember. But, um, yeah, just, I, mean, I remember the change room after the game. I remember the icebox went flying and, and the guys that were on the bench were screaming. Everyone was just going crazy. And it, it's, it's, it's a pretty weird feeling because you're trying to process everything. You know, you just played and you played in the game and, and, and you knew it was a big moment. You know, you knew it was a big moment in the sport, but then you're physically exhausted. You know, you just want to have a drink and have something to eat and, and, and you know, try and process everything. But all this craziness is going on in the change room as well. And it's, um, yeah, it's a really, really bizarre feeling. And you could just see people, smiles on people's faces and some people crying in the change rooms. And, you know, it's just, you know, that's, that's a special moment in, in when you're a footballer and you're a professional athlete, like those kind of moments when, when you're out on the pitch, you're there for everyone to see and for everyone to, um, you know, everyone can see that you know, you're out there and you're exposing yourself to, to the public and, and as a team, you're out there and there's no place to hide. But it's these intimate moments that make sport really special when you come back into the change room. So the moments in change rooms before games, when you're having your pregame talks, the moments after games that you enjoy with your teammates that no one else can see, um, you know, the emotion that goes into all that stuff. Um, you know, when when... Oftentimes, as a sports person, football or whatever else, you know, in, in football, people see you for 90 minutes, don't they? They see, they, see, they see what you are for 90 minutes. They don't see all the other bits and pieces that go along with that, the training. They don't see all the hardships, the sacrifices that people have to make when they, they fly out. And, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes along um, to prepare you for those 90 minutes that everyone else can see. So those intimate moments when you're in the changing rooms is really, really special time. And, Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've seen some of your videos. I think there's some stuff on Facebook. I don't know if it's you. It might have been on from Ace 
might have posted some stuff way back when I had a look at it a little while ago. And right, right. Yeah, it was it was mental. It was like the I like I say, the ice bucket went somewhere and some of the guys were sliding on the floor through the ice and Yeah, yeah. Um right. Yeah, and then you got Phil like not in a good way behind us in in the in the toilet cubicle thrown up and we're yeah. all mentally physically exhausted but at the same time it's this historic moment so it's all these emotions rolled into one um it was just yeah just special just really really special but then like you say you know you've got to get yourselves ready and go again in three days time um to play against Myanmar and we had to play at a different stadium so we had to move and go to a different hotel um I actually remember that I'm because I'm sh- I used to room with Ali, and I'm sure Ali was poorly before that game. I'm mm-hmm. sure he was. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe my maybe my memory's playing tricks on me or not. But I don't know. But I seem to remember that Ali wasn't. He was poorly. He was ill. Um, while whilst we were at that other hotel, and I think I had to take some food to him. Like he didn't come down for dinner one day, and I had to take some food back to the room for him. But um, was this, yeah, was, and then, was this the Myanmar match? I think so, yeah. I, th- yeah. I think so. Um, you'll have to ask him and, and see if I'm, I'm right or wrong. But mm-hmm. I seem to remember that he didn't come down for dinner one day. I had to take yeah. some food back for him. Right. Um, possibly caught what Phil had, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, then you, you, whatever day we played that, then again, it's you wake up the next day, you've got to do a recovery. Mm-hmm. You've got to do everything again. Um, slowly start prepping for a game in two days time because this the schedule is brutal really i mean it's That's two right. days in between games is you know when you consider what the guys get for world cup games and you consider what you're playing in the humidity and stuff in asia is um is really really tough that's right i actually have that video of the post-match celebration right from the final whistle it's about seven minutes long i'll just share it with you offline that's kind of yeah. long and there's a lot of swearing going on in there <laughs> <laughs> but it's I imagine a lot of that came from Anton, did it? Yeah, Anton, myself, Neil, everyone. <laughs> that was pretty wild. Okay, yeah. um, we needed a point off Myanmar, but I'm fu- I'm gonna backtrack. You mentioned that it was cold in Nepal, or uh, playing in in the next in the following year. But after Vietnam, we drove an hour and a half to Ma- to Nam Din to play in Myanmar, where it was cold. And yeah. they stuck us in a hotel where the food wasn't as great. Yeah. In fact, we had to go out. And I'm going to show you this picture here. I, I, want, I wonder if you remember this, what, what happened here. Do you remember the, our first morning there when we went jogging and these guys in motorcycles were following us and taunting the team, at, daring the team to pick a fight? Do you remember uh, that? Yeah. V- vaguely, I, re- I vaguely remember going for that walk. Yeah, I remember it was cold, a lot colder there. I remember, I don't remember getting taunted, but um, I remember going for, for walks around that area for sure. Um, I remember, yeah. I did, didn't we train in Christmas hats or something one of the days as well? <laughs> Is that exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, um, by the time that we played uh, Myanmar, they had prepared for us. And they, we had a tough time in that match. We had a number of chances to score, but we couldn't break them down as well. Um, but, you know, uh, any celebration was tempered by the fact that we were not going to have a home game. Can you, what's your recollection of that, Rob? I don't remember any of, um, I don't remember thinking about that you know that kind of the the home game they're having a home game I don't remember that playing a part in my my personal preparation for that game mm-hmm. um you no, know no, it no. just yeah um I don't think it tempered any any celebration in the immediate aftermath after the game for me personally um mm-hmm. you know just to get through to the semi-final was was reason to celebrate enough um yes yeah, so obviously it was a disappointment to for us not to be able to play at home and, and mm-hmm. you know, the, when you go back to Manila and, and as the days pass, then that probably sinks in a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. But you're kind of riding on, I just remember that the, at the time it was just, it was a wave of, so you get back from, 
Vietnam, having secured that game against Myanmar, it was a bit of a dead rubber of a game. Mm. We didn't play particularly well. It probably yeah. wasn't a very good game to watch. Mm-hmm. And yet there was still a lot riding on it. Um, so we knew that they would be dangerous. So, yeah, it was, it was just one of those games that kind of everyone forgets. But it's, it was, the result was, was paramount. I think, I think Singapore lost in the last game anyway against Vietnam. From, yeah, they did. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they lost. They lost. Um, but, I mean, even when we got back to Manila after Vietnam, then it was, you know, it was mental after that. It was media everywhere, everyone wanting to, you know, the training sessions that we were, were playing in where people come to watch us train. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of guys had media commitments. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you remember making an appearance at the halftime of a... Philippine Basketball Association. Game. Yeah, I do. I do I remember that. I remember because it was quite a few days, isn't it? It's. I mean, it's probably yeah. what is it over a week? Certainly over yeah. a week that in between yeah. games. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it is. You know, every, like yeah, I do remember all that. I remember going at halftime of the basketball game and meeting people and just opened a lot of doors for for the team for mm-hmm. commercial avenues for. Um, you know, the players as an, on an individual to push themselves um, as personalities as well. Um, so there was just so much stuff going on around it. And that was always in the, and then obviously in the back of your mind as well, you've got the disappointment of not being able to play, play in front of everyone, which was, you know, it, it was it, obviously it was a disappointment, you know, looking back now, as you retrospectively look back, you knew, it would have been a real shame because the, the, the Sri Lankan World Cup qualifiers and stuff proved that and the Q8 games proved that how how amazing that moment could have been. Yeah. Yep. Um, but at least we did get to experience that, you know, as a group, you know, a lot of those t- that team did play in those games. So we did get to experience what it was like to play at home. Mm-hmm. Um, we were just stoked as well. I mean, personally, I was just thrilled to be through to a semi-final and, and, I mean, let's be honest. It's there. There are worse places to play than than in that stadium in in Indonesia, anyway. So, um, I mean, th- those two games were just absolutely the, the, the whole. I don't know how long it was we were away, but the month or whatever it was, six weeks, five weeks, yeah. was just absolutely crazy, wasn't it? I mean, right. And right. again, having to go out there to Indonesia and play in those two games in front of that, in front of those crowds, was just eighty thousand people, man. But I mean, at the time, um, I, I spoke about it on, on, on with Chrissy on, on one of his podcasts. But my, me and before I went out for the, the qualifiers, um, so that would have been November time. Me and my wife, that there, there, there's been a few bits and pieces going on at home, and um, you know, it, I had to I had to leave home at a really tough time for for me and her as a as a, as a couple. Um, so obviously came back and then, uh, you know, we were working through that and then we had to go, then I had to go away again for the, for the, for the December camp out in, well, the, the, the tournament out in Vietnam and mm-hmm. yeah, we, we'd had a bit of, um, you know, family, I don't really want to go into too much detail, but there was, there, it was a tough time for us as a family. And, um, so I was, I'm so thankful that. Um, I, I said to Boss Dan and, and Macker at the time, I said, look, is there any way I can get my wife to come out here um, to experience this with us? I explained this, you know, how, you know, what was going on at the time with us. And, and um, they said, yeah, absolutely. Let's get her out. And, and I'm, you know, forever thankful for, for Dan for being able to do that and for Macker and allowing me to, to get her to be part of it. And so, you know, while all this madness was going on, um, in Manila, I was also focusing on getting my wife out and, you know, making sure that she was picked up from the airport and she was traveling on her own to, to Manila and had to make sure that she was taken care of. And so all these kind of training commitments, media commitments, I had my wife coming out, um, which was really special. And then she actually flew with us as well to Indonesia. I don't know if you remember Rick, but yeah, she, she, she came out and was there. Um, she was there at the first, for the first Indonesia game, for the first leg of the game, um, mm-hmm. the semi-final. So, 
yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on in, in, in my life around that time. Um, it just kind of makes it even more special, really. And, and she was there to, with my mum and dad. My mum and dad were in the stadium. My, my dad's got a video of the second goal, uh, the second Gonzalez strike. He managed to catch it on his mobile phone. Uh -huh. uh, so we've got that video here of what it was like when when team when that that noise that was created. But yeah, I mean having them there, my mum, my dad, and my wife for the first game after everything that happened like two months prior to that um, was really special, really. Um, and I'm I'm I'll forever be thankful for for the management team for letting me for letting me bring her out. Right, right. As I recall, um, Rob, I think. Ali's mom joined us in Nam Din, didn't she? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, yeah. I know that we, we always have a kind of, um, and not, there's always a few people coming out to support yeah. us, isn't there? Yeah. Um, making exactly. the journey. Exactly. And, and that, that was the sad thing about not being able to play at home was not as, you know, there weren't as many um, family members able to come out as, they, as they, what they should have been. We had a home game to experience it all with us. That that was probably the biggest disappointment, really. Okay, Askel's mania exploded in the Philippines with that win over Vietnam, and it got even bigger when the team qualified for the semifinals. What people don't know outside the Filipino fans was that the Askels were attracting attention from even Indonesian fans. I'm going to share with you a video. I don't I don't think you've seen this, Rob. It's one of those videos that I took. Uh, this. Let me play for you. Look at all those fans. <laughs> this is a training session, Rick. Yes, it was. Yeah. Not even smart dealers got this. Oh, yeah. And this is only practice, buddy. Yeah. Smart dealers did a lot of times also. Grab it. That's me and Mark Sambrano yeah. talking. Like this. Yes, men are in there. stretched all over the place. Yeah, I mean it was it was just crazy, wasn't it? The whole experience. I remember us training at UMAC as well back in Manila, and and we had huge, you know, there was not a spare seat in the in the training stadium even at UMAC, and right, right. yeah, I mean it just goes to show what you know we kind of captured the imagination. It's it's. You know, everyone likes an underdog, a fairy tale story. You know, Leicester winning the Premier League, and you know the feel-good factor that that brought around football at the time. I'd imagine that this was pretty similar. Um, if if anyone done, you know, if if anyone was to do a Last Dance kind of documentary on on that time, it, you know, it, you know, Ali's suggestion for that one—it's the first dance, actually. That's what Ali. Was yeah, the first dance. That's it. Um, but yeah, it was just, I mean, look, it just, the whole thing just captured everyone's imagination and then to be, to be front and center and to have been part of it. Was, yeah, was actually I have a lot of video. In fact, during this training session, I, I have actual video of it, talking to Indonesian fans and they were, I was asking them, oh, what do you think of the Philippines? And there's, they were saying like, while I'm still rooting for Indonesia, I like the Philippines. And I asked them why, oh, they're good and they have a lot of handsome guys here. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asking that the, I'm going to share those videos with you off 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 tube. And it's really incredible because they were saying I like this player, I like that player. It was it was absolutely amazing. So I knew Askel's meaning was in full swing. When for the people watching this webcast with Rob Gear, um, so that you know when we were playing in Maidin National Stadium, there was hardly anyone watching there to support the team. When we got to Nam Din, twelve Englishmen, twelve Britons flew over. Some were friends of, of, of Maka. Some were Britain stay, working in Hanoi. They flew over. They drove over to Namdin. They were wearing Askel's jerseys. And yes, I have pictures. They were cheering for us. When we got to Indonesia, I don't know if you remember this picture, Rob. The Philippine Embassy. Yeah, I do. I do. I remember. I remember that. I remember that. Um... Yeah, I mean that that was kind of a thing after the happened quite a lot uh, whenever we went on away games or, or camps and stuff. We would always go to the embassy in the local in the local right. city, and yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of the pride that people had for us. And it was it to kind of 
elicit those kind of emotions for other people and to make them proud of, of being a Filipino is it's kind of makes everything worthwhile. You know, it's, um, I mean, the reception that we received there and every time we went to an embassy or, you know, met any fans in foreign countries as well, it was, you know, the, the welcome we got was always with so much pride and it was such a happy time. It really was. Right. Look at us all there, all fresh faced. <laughs> And it was a break from eating all this halal food because we had some <laughs> food over there. I'm going to have a couple more pictures and then we can wrap this up. I want to take, want you to take the fans and the participants through this picture. What was it like inside that locker room? Pre games, discussions with Maka. Oh, that, that's a cool photo. Um, so what is this pre game pre pre the first game in the locker room before the first game? You know what? I don't actually remember that that the change room. I remember some change rooms that we've been in before, but I don't remember that one. I remember uh, the thing I know about the stadium though is you you walk you walk up, don't you, up the stairs to come yeah. out into the stadium. Uh -huh. So you while you're waiting underneath, you're essentially waiting underneath the stands. That's right. The stadium. The, the that was a long long this, one's in, this one's actually in Vietnam, sorry. Okay, right, okay. Um, yeah, I, thinking about like going back, going forward to, to the Indonesia game, yeah, you, so you're under the stadium, you're waiting, you, you can hear 70, 80,000 people, and you know it's 70, 80,000 Indonesians as well, by the way. There's not like, there's not like 20,000 Filipinos there to, to shout for you either. So, you know, they're kind of baying for your blood. It is very much like entering, entering the Coliseum, essentially, where you're, you know, you're going out to perform in front of that many people. Um, bizarre experience. But I love, I love the change of rooms before games. I love that kind of sanctuary. I liked it. I, um, I was someone that kind of, I did suffer from nerves as a kid. Um, and then as I got older, I, I, I figured out a way to be able to control those moments. Um, you know, looking back at looking back at your career, it's it's these moments that I probably miss more than actually playing. You know, in a weird way, just the 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 camaraderie you have with the team, the 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 excited. There's a nervousness around the room, but there's an excitement around the room. Um, you know that when you've got a really special team, it's it's it. The change of room is great. There's not a lot needs to be said. You, you know, you make a lot of eye. You do a lot of talking with your eyes. Essentially, you know, you look at someone and you see if they're ready and if how how they're doing. Right. Um, and then I guess that's the skill of of the more senior players and the coach to then see how the changing room feels at the time and if anyone needs to to, to have a little chat with them or if they if they're good or they're the moment. They're they're really special moments and I, I used to love. Um, all this kind of stuff being in the changing room before the game. So it was, you know, preparing for battle, if you like. Right, right. If you, if you recall, Rob, it was Neil who was playing the music back then. When I took this picture, it was exactly at the moment Maka says, okay, let's start. So Neil switches off his boombox, his iPod, and everyone's getting ready. But it was Neil who was playing a lot of the music back then, if you recall. Yeah, I think he probably still is in charge of a lot of the music, I'd imagine, Neil. Right, right. Because he wanted to set the tone. And because I, rem I, I took a lot of videos. And in fact, I, I wrote an article today, I tagged you, where I mentioned the titles of the songs that he was playing. And then when he got to the locker room, he played something more light because he wanted people to unwind and not get nervous. So that's what it was like. But here's another picture. Before game one. Pre game limber. Yeah. So where would that have been at the hotel or something, I suppose, right? Yes, it was. And right before the game of football tennis, if you recall. Yeah, I do. I do I remember. Did, I yeah, I do. I remember we used to have quite a lot of limbers. Um, you know, something kind of hadn't experienced before coming to the Philippines. You know, not really warming up on the day of the game, like going for a walk and a stretch, but it kind of became a bit of a ritual, didn't it? And it, it got to the point where if you didn't do it, it felt like a, it felt a little bit weird not to do it. And yeah, normally led by Chief, 
Chiefy would always take us through a stretching routine. Chiefy or Ali. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, just and then just they're just more moments where the team gets an opportunity to come together, you know, to be to be around each other, talk about the game or talk, not talk about the game or however whatever one ever you know however everyone felt at the time and um, you know I never saw any any other teams doing any of this stuff and you know mm. maybe it's just one of those things that set us apart again that we got to spend even more time together and to be together as a group. Right, right. Okay, um, let's talk about Indonesia to wrap this up. But before Indonesia, I want to show you this video. One of those training sessions. Okay, uh, it's the last video I'll share. Remember this, Rob? Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Um, again, it was just another thing, another th- Another thing to keep us occupied, to keep us competitive as a team. Um, you know, it, don't, I don't really, re- again, I don't remember a lot of teams doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, it, when you look at it like that, doesn't that just look like a group of lads just having a bit of a fun, bit of a bit of a kick about? Uh, it, kept you know I mean? it kept everyone loose, Rob. Yeah, exactly. Kept everyone relaxed, kept everyone kept everyone together. There was always batter flying around. Um, people taking the mick out of people. Ah, oh, Chrissy, can you send me that? I'll send it on to him. Wow. For sure. Wow. Uh, I'll put it on a Google Drive for you, Rob. Because there's a yeah. lot. There's just a lot. Like you said, I must have taken, I probably took around three dozen videos. Everything, even the press conferences, I have the videos. So... All right, it was it, like it, like I say. This is you look at it, and it's just it's just guys having a kick about, and that's what uh-huh. we were. We were a group of, you know, we were a team, but we were a group of friends, really close friends that got on really well. And that and there's old man Ray Johnson as well. Yeah, we're gonna have him on next week. Jimmy's on 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 in Monday. Oh, great! This is a game. I didn't realize it was a game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to end it right there. Uh, the last topic that we have two more topics. One is Indonesia and one the post-2010. post, post Indonesia, they had a tough time against us. They only won by a score of 1-0 in each game. Those days of beating us by what? Scores of 5-0, 7-0, 13-1, they were over. Your thoughts about those two matches, especially... Did you feel that we sort of ran out of gas at that point? No. I mean, you know, there's a lot of energy, like I said, that goes into this, these tournaments. That you, um, for me personally as well, there was a lot of um, off-the-field stuff going on as, as well. Like I, I just mentioned a minute ago, my wife was there. So, uh-huh. um, the, I mean, you could argue that there was – we we started to get tired, but mm-hmm. not for the first game. Do you know what I mean? It's like that's these are once in a lifetime opportunities that you just got to get yourselves up for. Um, just we just didn't really have enough quality on the day for for these two games. You remember the first goal, um, the first goal in the first leg was it was a mistake or a miscommunication uh-huh. between Ray and Neil. Uh-huh. Um, that probably wouldn't have happened if we had played in Manila. Right. For example. I agree. Um, the, the noise was absolutely deafening. I don't remember too much about the game, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. I don't remember if we were under the cosh. I don't remember if it was even. I don't I, – I just remember the – I remember the actual event. I remember it being you could not – Ali, you know, Ali could be two metres away. Yeah. And then hunt on two meters the other way and you could shout at the top of your voice and it would be absolutely irrelevant. You could not hear anything. Yeah. Um horns, the fans cheering. Um you know, you you the things that stick in my mind are that of the crowd. Just like walking out, like I say, walking out almost into like a Roman Colosseum type stuff, like um coming up those stairs. Um, with that FIFA music playing in the background, I remember that clear as day. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I remember looking around to try and find my wife and, and um, 
my mum and dad. Um, yeah, he was, you know, obviously a British guy with a Filipino shirt, so he was probably a little bit easy to pick out in the crowd, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just remember all those bits and uh, I obviously remember the goal. Uh, but I, don't, I can't remember. I mean, they were stacked as well. They had, you know, such a great team, didn't they? Some really big names yeah. in, in that team. Um, and, um, you know, no doubt that it gave them an extra advantage to play two home games against us. When you can draw, you know, collectively, there been 160,000 people over the two games supporting you, it's going to have an, it's going to have an impact in the game. Because um, momentum then is, is not, is, is tough to shift in a game. Uh Um, over two legs as well you know we did it once against Vietnam when there was you know a lot of people in that stadium at the time Um, but to have to do it over a two leg game um, is that's 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 a really tough ask right right nevertheless the Philippines uh, Philippine football would not be dreary anymore because uh, by virtually making the semi-finals that we had we avoided the qualifying stage for the next tournament right now, Ascot's Mania was in full swing, and I wonder if you recall this, uh, something I did for you guys when we, retur- when we returned, full page print ad in the Manila newspapers. Yeah, I mean, that, that That's was... an iconic photo. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was, yeah, after that, after you got back, you know, everything went crazy after that. I mean, that's probably the case then for the next 18 months, would you say? Something like that, I would have thought. Yep, yep. Um, you know, a lot of, yeah, and it was, it, again, the kind of, it captured everyone's emotions. It captured um, everyone liked the underdog story. We come from, we come from nothing to, to achieve something huge. Captured the, the imagination of the nation and made, made the country proud of, of being Filipinos and, yeah. Um, I, I'm guessing that was after the Kuwait game or Sri Lanka game, possibly, Nick, yes. Rick, that one. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka. Yeah. Sri Lanka game, yeah. Yeah, another full page yeah. ad that came out in the newspapers. And um, yeah. I was just really happy to do this for you guys because, I mean, what, it's the least that I could do to, to do something. Yeah, like I mean, and, it, and then, the, you know, these the company started rolling in and everyone wanted a piece of the, you know, a piece of the pie, really. It's that's what kind of made 2010 that little bit more special because none of that was around then. You know, it was, it was, it was, uh, got to be careful how I word it. It was, it was a little bit more pure almost. You were, the reasons you were doing it for weren't for money, fame, endorsements, Mm -hmm. um, you know, progression of career or anything like that. It was a moment in time where it was, where we had the support of a, of a few people, you know, yourself, thankfully boss Dan came in and, and, and really helped, helped out. Um, you know, there's, there's people that were, were around pre 2010. Um, and that's why it was, it was a really special time because uh, there wasn't, there wasn't any extra support really. We, we had to do it. We were there doing it for ourselves by ourselves as a group. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, something, something fucking amazing happened out of it. So it was, yeah, Rob, perfect. Looking back at it now, ten years later, what do you tell your son? I'm curious because we saw your son earlier. What do you tell him about 2010? What do you tell your friends about it? What is the legacy of 2010, man? Oh, goodness. The legacy of 2010. Well, it what it did, it enabled us, it enabled football to have a platform in the Philippines, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Um, in those preceding years after, after, the, after 2010, um, has it always been handled and managed in the right way? Uh, I don't know, you'd, you'd have to question that because at the moment the league's in a little bit of disarray. Uh-huh. But it enabled, it enabled the sport to have a platform. Mm-hmm. It enabled um, younger generations to be inspired by, um, by what we achieved back then. Mm-hmm. Um, 
especially with people like seeing people like Chiefy and Hanair and Boogie and Yanti playing and Ian playing in those games, you know, it can inspire inspire some more local based talent to to emerge. Um, I think it's paved the way for a lot of people to come into the Philippines into the national team now that probably wouldn't have done in the past. If I'm honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think whenever you whenever you look forward, whenever you plan to go forward, and whatever plans you have, and, and anyone that joins the team, or I think you have to have you have to have an understanding of where it's come from. I think that's really important, and I think as a marker. I mean, history for Philippine football, that was, um, it was probably the biggest marker there is. Um, so I think it's important that we always acknowledge what happened. Not, not just the, not, not the results per se, not, but just how it happened, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Like how the circumstances around, you know, what it was like back then and what people had to endure even pre-2010. I think it's important that everyone remembers the legacy before it whilst they're also planning to go forward. I think that's really important. Right. Um, hopefully, I, I hope that people will continue to look back on it as a time that, that everyone will have their own special moment of it. I was lucky to be front and centre on mm-hmm. the pitch at the time it happened. You know, yourself, you were, I guess, fortunate as well to be part of that inner sanctum at the time. But then there'll be people that remember it for different reasons, for being down the, the local bar or watching it on telly at home how that made them feel at that moment. Um, there'll be people watching in, in other countries and, you know, my, my, my family, my mum and dad will have different memories of it as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that will live with me forever. I'll be eternally, eternally proud of what we achieved, what I achieved as well. Um, you know, you have to look at it from an individual point of view. And I was, you know, my time with the Philippines was, was without doubt has been the, the, the best, the highlight of my career, my, my time with the national team. It enabled, 2010 enabled us to have so many more memories off the back of that. Um, you know, Q8, Shrocky's gold against Q8. Yeah. Uh, the game against Sri Lanka where the Pack Stadium, uh, Mongolia where Chiefy scored that iconic goal. You know, you know what I mean? All these moments were heightened and probably made possible by by 2010 you know even going forward going carrying on now to uh asian cup qualification a couple of years back mm-hmm. you know it, would the momentum have been there for the progression of the team had 2010 not happened i, I doubt that very much right. um so yeah we have to be thankful for it and that, that's why i think it's such an important important landmark moment in in the history of, of the sport in the country Important is the right word, and Rob Gear was an important piece to that Asgals team. Uh, for Usapang Football, we want to thank Rob. Thank you for your time. Technically, it was like playing a full match for this interview. <laughs> thank you for taking this time. I know that you're a man who cherishes his downtime. Regards to the family, any last words for the people watching, for the frontliners out there? Anything, Rob? No, well, I just, I always, I mean, we've, I've talked about this. this 2010 quite a bit over the last you know kind of six weeks during lockdown um and there's moments where it feels a little bit self-indulgent um but i i but i i appreciate the the importance of it especially after 10 years and i i just thank you rick for kind of giving me the platform to be able to speak about it um i, I do think Welcome. it's a really important moment to to uh, special time to talk about and it, it, it helps me it's, it's almost cathartic for me as well to talk about it and to relive those memories because sometimes after 10 years you kind of forget what it was like mm-hmm. um so just thank you for that i i really appreciate it and i'd look forward to seeing some of your photos and videos um to everyone that's taken the time to sit in for an hour and a half i i, I appreciate it even if you popped in for five or ten minutes uh, here in a Hearing someone waffle about um, their time back in um, 10 years ago, it was, I'd encourage everyone to go out and watch some videos of that moment because it was a very special time. Um, And then on the broader thing, on the broader kind of um, topic of the day, just everyone stay safe, you know, follow, follow, follow advice, Um, be safe, look after each other, look after your families. Um, 
thank you to everyone that's kind of working so hard during this pandemic um, to enable people like me to stay at home and just look after our kids. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone for taking the time out today. All right, Rob Deere. For uh, Phil Oil Flying D Presents, this is Usapang Football with Rick Olivares. Thank you for your time, all those watching. Angel Girado, thank you for not going away and staying tuned to this. Uh, we, we have a few other footballers here locally watch. Chief is there. Ian's there. Roel is there. Uh, Ali ducked in and out. So we're seeing quite a few people. Coach Maor Rosen is watching. So a lot of people are watching all over. Uh, there's a message here. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Rob, and God bless. Hope you guys are safe over there in England. So, Rob, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good morning. Bye, Rob. Thanks, Ray. Bye.